Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're talking about the 1777 Charleville musket. Early on in America's firearms history, military and committee of safety use of military arms was dominated by the English brown bass musket. But when the American colonists found themselves at odds with their European English rulers, they were in dire need of another kind of military arm that was both durable, reliable, and allowed the interchangeability of parts so they could fight for their independence. Somewhat frustrated with their English counterparts, the French were fairly quick to step in and supply the scrappy American colonists with a military arm that would provide several upgrades from the earlier pattern brown vest muskets that the colonists had from previous military endeavors. Now, in comparison to the brown vest musket, the Charlottesville has a few distinct differences. And at this period, something that made this incredibly important for the American colonists were these barrel bands here. They provided quick and easily disassembly and cleaning of their military arms. The brown vest muskets that we see documented as you know the early colonists having uh, during the early parts of the American Revolution are still the barrel pinned style of brown vest where we have metal barrel pins holding the barrel to the stock. With these metal barrel bands like we have on this Charleville here, like I said, we have very easy disassembly and it makes it a much more durable musket for the period, giving the scrappy American colonists in their small numbers, even as they build the Continental Army, a bit more of a durable arm to go into the field with. Thinking about the early parts of the American War for Independence, we don't have a lot of military supply lines set up. A lot of this is kind of fly by night getting things done. And a durable arm like the Charlottesville design had, introducing the barrel bands earlier, gave the American colonists a little bit of a leg up. They didn't have to worry or, or rely on logistics to bring in as many military replacement parts for their muskets because these were reportedly uh, a little bit more durable than the brown vest muskets they had access to previously. This is a reproduction of a 1777 Charleville musket. So this would have come in a little bit later in the American War for Independence coming over from Europe. I believe this is a Petter Soli reproduction, but its maker's marks have since been removed. This is a 69 caliber smooth bore barrel, features a nice, you know, pretty stiffly figured walnut stock. There's not a lot of fancy curl in here. That is very typical though for military arms of the time. We have iron hardware everywhere. This operates just like many other flintlocks out there. We do not have a set trigger. We just have a single trigger here. So we can cock the hammer to half cock, close our pan, bring the cock back. Really heavy, durable springs on these military muskets. And with a fairly heavy trigger pull there, the cock falls. If you're interested in American military arms, I'm certainly not an expert. I really recommend you check out this book, United States Martial Flintlocks by Robert Riley. This is a very loved and very used copy I was able to pick up, but this provides a really interesting look at military arms from the beginning up through the flintlock era of American military history. Uh, this starts with basically the, the Charleville musket and the introduction of the brown bess and how the Charleville came through and replaced the brown bess as we went into the American Revolution. While mostly earlier weapons were shipped to America, the Charleville patterns 1763 and 1768, which differ from each other only in minor details, would provide the basis of development for the United States and its first official military infantry weapon beginning in 1795 and continuing for many years to come. Not only the regulation muskets as produced at the National Armories at Springfield, Massachusetts and Harpers Ferry, Virginia, but those too produced under the contracts of 1798 and 1808 to private arms makers in the Northeast would all be based on these French models. Not only did the French weapons provide a fledgling America with the wherewithal in which to find their independence, but the muskets provided a stronger, more practical arm than the brown bess, which has been the pattern for all American-made muskets during the war years. The importation of French military arms like the Charleville here didn't just help us win the war, they helped inspire American arms manufacturing for really the next hundred years. If you look at American military arms, while they become their own, especially in the late 1800s, you can still lay an early French military arm like the Charleville on a table next to a majority of American military arms, especially in the black powder era 
and see the similarities and the inspirations. As many of us know, the military practices of the time weren't really concerned about the accuracy of the individual. Military practice for the period was to line up as many muskets and cannons as possible and have them go at each other firing as quickly as possible with shooters in military documentation, you know, being demanded that they shoot, you know, three to four times per minute. To help aid in that, another contrast to civilian use of muzzleloaders at the time was the paper cartridge. This is a rudimentary example of a paper cartridge that I've made to go along with this 1777 Charleville based on Duelist 1954, Mike Bellevue's video and research that he has put out about this. Paper cartridges were extremely common for the historical period. We don't see them used as much in civilian use, especially with civilian rifles. So inside my paper cartridge here, I have a 67 caliber round ball at the base tied with a piece of linen thread and then I have 80 grains of Goex 2F powder. This is not a military load, this is more of a plinking fun load for me to try out in this Charleville. Now traditionally in the period you'd have your paper cartridge in a cartridge box. The shooter would take the paper cartridge, tear it at the lip and prime their pan with this same powder that they're pouring down the bore. Now Due to modern safety practices, I'm not going to be doing that. We're going to prime after everything is loaded. But we're going to start anyway with pouring our 80 grains of 2F down the bore. And with that, we can shove our ball into the end of the muzzle. Pull our ramrod. Bring all the way home. Now in a military lineup, you'd wanna be careful about how your ramrod was situated so you weren't bonking the guy next to you. But uh, thankfully here in the woods, we don't have to worry about that too much. As with any other flintlock muzzleloader then, we can take ourselves up to half cock. I'm gonna pick my vent here just real quick. And then I'm going to be priming with some 4F black powder here. Close our frizz and we're ready to go. Nothing quite like a big board musket like that. That was pretty good. On the campaign, they would have used pamphlets or other printed material to roll their cartridges uh, in kind of a, a worst case scenario, I guess, uh, where they were making their own cartridges. In larger military campaigns with larger supply lines and infrastructure though, we see these cartridges being made at military arsenals or military armories. Although it was part of the individual military members training to be able to make their own cartridges in the evening or in camp at some capacity. Now, military practice at the time really dictated a lot of really clean muzzle loading. This was a reliable tool for them and it needed to be reliable at all times. So while this musket has a little bit of rust and patina on it, this would have been scrubbed and cleaned each night to keep it in operating order. And then maybe if time or supply allowed or demanded, they would produce some of their own cartridges. Now, traditionally, and in history class and in movies and popular culture, we really just hear about these muskets being just totally inaccurate. And while it wasn't a priority for the militaries of the era to have you know, extreme accuracy, we see smoothboard muzzleloaders being used in a wide variety of applications by the civilians of the era to accurately hunt, take game, and defend themselves. So while it's not a precision rifled barrel, to some capacity here, you have an accurate tool. Otherwise, it wouldn't be used. If I couldn't see and, and target and hit the line of, you know, enemy military members, we'll say, you know, 50 yards down the way, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be practical to carry the thing. So our first three shots out of this musket, I was aiming at the center red coat here, aiming right about here, this top V here. Our first two shots we have kind of connecting there and we have our third shot in the heart. So this is a little bit of a scaled down target. You can kind of see me here in relation to it. I, maybe it's 
three quarters half size. And while we were only you know, 15, 20 yards away, that's still some decent accuracy out of a smooth bore barrel with that paper cartridge. In the spirit of the 1777 Charleville here, we're gonna see how quickly I can dispatch each of these red coat targets with my paper cartridges. We're gonna start the clock with the ignition of my first shot. We hit, so that's good. Hit. and hit. Okay, you can see the time on the screen now. He wasn't really keeping track. So uh, maybe it was good, you know? Maybe that was quick, and maybe it just felt quick, uh, like the Cabin Fever Challenge did. And uh, it's actually really slow, but nonetheless, you know, it's kind of fun. Uh, you're kind of under time pressure there. And, uh, you know, it's kind of neat. You know, it's, that's something neat about these military arms. I'll admit, I'm really not a military historian when it comes to muzzle loading, uh, my interest is much more in the civilian side of things. But because of the prominence of the Charleville musket and its use by you know, normal people signing up to defend and, and gain their independence, uh, to me this kind of has a special connection between the military usage and the civilian usage in history. Back here at the targets for our little timed challenge here, our first target Again, kind of aiming in this region here, we're shooting a little bit low. Uh, I will say the lock time isn't super fast, so that might be my own holdover. Our additional shot is here in our center target, kind of a gut belly shot there. Wouldn't be good, wouldn't be good for that fella. And then we have another little bit of a low and to the left uh, shot here. Not a bad grouping, but not exactly precision. Uh, for any kind of any kind of time trial there. I think historically these wounds would be pretty tough on somebody though. The odds are though if they had their muskets ready to go um, They probably would have taken me out too, but thankfully we don't have to deal with that. A group of redcoats moving through the woods here Good little American. We've got our musket by our side We're gonna see if we can take them out Thankfully they're real slow And the last one topples over. That was cool. My barrel is super hot. I am drenched in sweat, but that is a fun exercise going through and setting up a little stage like that. I hope, uh, I hope it was as fun to watch it. Maybe I could do something in editing to make it a little more quicker for you. But uh, that was a lot of fun. I really encourage you if you have one of these military style arms, smooth bore, you know, or, you know, just a civilian style muzzle loading rifle from really any period. You know, it's a lot of fun to go out and, and shoot them. And we all know that silhouettes and paper and things, but we're seeing a lot more interest now in these moving matches and the skills associated with moving and shooting and being fit and being active. And I encourage you, if you're interested in that kind of thing, 
and interested in muzzleloading. It might be the kind of thing to try at your home range if you have that capability or if your muzzleloading club allows something like that where you're out moving, getting active a little bit. It can be a lot of fun and uh, really engages more history and more muzzleloading than something like a, you know, a paper match would or, or a silhouette you know, NRA style match. Here you can see a bit more of a one-to-one -one comparison to me, a real life kind of average sized man to the scale of this target. Not exactly one-to-one, -one. I don't know that it's exactly half either, um, but you know, a pretty good target for testing out and playing with these smooth bores. All of these shots, uh, this one's a little bit on the line. We'll say it could maybe hit the guy behind him. Um, <laughs> all these are pretty well in a, a spot that would really kind of injure this guy. Uh, we were shooting a little bit under the clock, under a little bit, bit of pressure through some uh, grassy terrain here. Not really long distance. You know, we weren't going over 50 yards here with any of these shots, but still you can see the effectiveness of the French Charleville musket in the hands of kind of your average young guy. Um, I will say that I think when we talk about military arms in comparison to now and then, um, just about every person that was in the military would have had some kind of practical application training in their life, whether that was hunting or defense of their homestead. I think through the history, we see uh, instances where people with no firearms experience were brought into the military, but I think a large swath of the people that made up the American Continental Army would have had some civilian level skill and training that was only amplified with the logistics of uh, you know, the early Continental Army and military practices that the French were able to bring over and assist with. So saying that, I think it's safe to say that your average military aged male during the American Revolution would have been a decent shot, even with a military arm like this. They would have had a lot of the, the mindset applied that you need to, to be an accurate shot and the military training, I think like we see in a lot of, of movies and films and stories and, and documentation from the era was more of refining that civilian force and bringing them into kind of traditional European military practice, which we see let go of, you know, in the next hundred years as war and as technology changed. I wanna bring that back here to yes, this is a smooth war. Yes, they aren't as accurate as rifled barrels, especially for the time period, but it is a still an effective tool and an effective weapon, especially when you put it into the hands of people that have lived and died by a flintlock. At this point in history, you know, the late 1700s, four generations. You can go from the early colonial days in the late 15 and early 1600s here in what became the United States of America and the dedication to the arms and the skills and the practices that goes into maintaining them and using them effectively is carried through history up to the American Revolution. And I think uh, for me, it's been a lot of fun out here in the woods here today, uh, using this piece of, albeit reproduction, this piece of American history, uh, you know, it kind of brings into to my mind frame now what it was like to, to carry and use one of these and what kind of shots you could get out of it. And I'm not by any means saying that this replicates any instance of war uh, then or now. Um, I think looking back on that, it was absolutely terrible. Some of the things that uh, people my age and younger and, and older really went through to give us the free country that we live in. But um, I find myself appreciating that history, the stories of everybody that was here more and more as I continue to research and understand muzzleloaders, especially uh, from the late 18th century. So that's all I have for you today. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. I hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, I've got a few more things like this planned. Uh, had a heck of a lot of fun out here today with this 1777 French Charleville musket. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.